Okay, well, it's my pleasure today uh, to introduce Noah Lemstra, who is an associate professor. Well, he's not sharing screen yet, but I can see on the screen that he's an associate professor of library and information science. Um, he's also a member of the growth um, executive, uh, faculty executive advisory committee. And um, he's been a long-term supporter of growth. And uh, this is the second time he's presented to us, uh, but his research is even more timely now than it was the last time he presented because there's been a lot of progress in how libraries are serving as hubs uh, for a whole variety of services for seniors. So I'm really excited to hear his presentation. Uh, you can tell your friends that if they weren't able to attend, we will be posting this on the UNCG Growth YouTube channel uh, eventually. And um, it'll be available for posterity uh, in, as long as YouTube exists, I guess. Uh, so um, without further ado, I'll introduce Noah Lenstra and uh, Please do put your questions in chat if you're on Zoom or raise your hand if you're in the room and uh, we'll get started. Hey, Noah. Today, uh, we're, we're considering public libraries uh, as multi-generational community centers, um, uh, looking at policy, practice, and research. Um, and to really just uh, ground what we're saying, um, uh, I think often we think of libraries as entities that provide services. Um, but I, I don't think that's actually empirically accurate. Um, I think it would be more accurate to think of public libraries as entities that amplify uh, what others are trying to do. Um, and this is a, a great example of that uh, that I found today uh, from Parkersburg, West Virginia, where the headline is three county agencies sponsoring fitness classes. Um, and then the first line is the Parkersburg Wood County Public Library, the YMCA of Parkersburg and Wood County Senior Center. Uh, Senior Citizens Association have joined uh, to bring free, free fitness classes to the public. Um, and so my, my kind of opening question slash provocation is how can we sit, shift our thinking from what can the library do for me um, to what can I do with the library? Um, I think that's really the question we should be asking ourselves, um, uh, especially those of us uh, who are actually trying to do uh, things involving um, the public. Um, and so these are just uh, what, what probably, when you think of public libraries, these are things that probably come to mind, uh, the Carnegie Library, uh, the Bookmobile, uh, Storytime. Um, and these things are, of course, part of uh, the legacy and tradition of public librarianship. Um, but there's also this, uh, this more complicated legacy, and I'm going to zoom into this text uh, in a second. Um, but this is from uh, a report to the nation of Australia on public libraries uh, from 1976. Um, with the title, Libraries Are Great Mate, uh, But They Could Be Greater. Um, and it says here, there are six jobs every library should be doing. Um, uh, but then uh, the, uh, the second paragraph says, uh, there is nothing that a community cannot do in its library if it sees the need and allocates the necessary priority provided the state and the Commonwealth give it the necessary support. Um, so this is about uh, <laughs> as, as broad as you could, you could imagine. Um, and, and it really uh, is kind of uh, this, this historical legacy, which has been around for as long as there have been public libraries. There have been people making this argument that the public library is really um, uh, an amplifier, um, an entity for the community to be used uh, by the community for whatever the community wants to do. Um, but that, that, that legacy is, is not really fully understood, uh, nor, nor um, uh, advocated for. Um, but uh, it, 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 it's starting to change. Um, and, and a great book um, on this topic that came out recently uh, is Eric Kleinenberg, a sociologist um, at New York uh, University, um, and Palaces for the People, How Social Infrastructure Can Help Fight Inequality, Polarization, and the Decline of Public li Civic Life. Um, 
He looks at public libraries uh, throughout uh, New York City um, and the, the various ways in which communities are appropriating their public library for um, diverse, ser diverse services. Um, and so with a nod um, to Robert Putnam uh, in his canonical book, uh, Bowling Alone, um, uh, Kleinenberg profiles how in basements of branches of the Brooklyn Public Library, um, libraries are offering vo virtual bowling leagues uh, for older patrons. Um, um, and as he says, marketing has never been the library's superpower and truer words have never been spoken. Um, <laughs> and that's, that's really um, the, the big challenge is that uh, across America, you, you're gonna find libraries doing things like this, um, but they're not really communicating what they're doing. Um, and so I see my, my job as a researcher is, is in part to be an advocate, a storyteller, um, someone who shares um, what the public library is actually doing across America so that we can really build up um, um, the, the political um, apparatus to, to give it the necessary support uh, to, to really amplify its, its role. Um, just, uh, but Kleinenberg is another great storyteller. And in, in addition to his book, um, he's published a lot. This is from an article um, he wrote for Slate uh, magazine called The Secret Life of Libraries, um, in which he talks about how on Manhattan, the Seward Park is one of many New York public library branches that offer karaoke sessions. They are especially popular with older Asian and Asian American patrons, some of whom travel together from branch to branch to sing as often as possible. Here are some regular participants wait for their turn to perform. And what I, what I find really remarkable about Kleinenberg's research um, is that it's, 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 I mean, to be blunt, it's, it's lazy research. Um, <laughs> I mean, he lives in New York City and he, he literally just went around to branches of the New York City Public Library and thought what they were offering. So that, that's kind of like, so anyone can do this. Anyone can go wherever you are in America, go, go and find out. Like that would be the, the first thing to do, like have some conversations, see what's happening. Um, and more likely than not, you're gonna surprise yourself. Um, and this is some of the things that you might find um, uh, in Northeast Ohio. Um, uh, they've been offering encore entrepreneurship uh, with, with many more public libraries offering entrepreneurial services. Um, uh, this is um, uh, services and classes for uh, people um, in the quote unquote second act of their lives, uh, wanting to uh, get into entrepreneurship and think about new business ventures. Um, and the person who's been spearheading this in Ohio um, is a woman called Fatima Perkins, um, who uh, is a former uh, staff member of the Cuyahoga County Public Library in Cleveland, um, and is now the director of community outreach and advocacy for the Western Reserve Area Agency on Aging. Um, and that's another thing that we're seeing increasingly. We're seeing increasing movement back and forth between people working in aging services and people working in public librarianship. And, and that exchange is bi-directional. Um, and it's becoming more, more common um, and frequent. Um, and so Fatima continues to be a tireless advocate for older adults, libraries, and librarians um, in her role as director of community outreach for this area agency on aging. Um, and she was also one, one of uh, a few presenters um, in this National Federation of Aging um, um, presentation from April 2021, which I would definitely encourage anyone to check out called More Than Books, uh, Libraries as Hubs for Social Connection. Um, and I'll, I'm gonna be coming back to that at the end of my presentation. But for now, like I said, uh, I mean, these examples are legion. Like every day I find examples. This was just one, when I was getting ready to do this presentation, I found out that in Oklahoma City, um, uh, the Metropolitan Library System of Oklahoma City um, teamed up with the Oklahoma City Ballet uh, to invite uh, people to join them for a fun class fo focused on moving and socializing for ages 50 plus. Um, I mean, you can find these anywhere. Um, and it's just, uh, it's, 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 it's just open your eyes. I mean, <laughs> it's, they're, they're out there for, for people that want to see them. Um, and, and it's really just, uh, and then the, the question becomes, what do you do with that information? How can you um, ask anyone who's trying to do something with their community? Have you, have you, have you talked with your librarian about how they can uh, help, you, help you go further with what you're trying to do? Um, and so just our agenda for today is to talk some about what do we know about how public libraries and public librarians are working with communities? Um, what do we need to know? Uh, what does the policy agenda focused on amplifying or accelerating um, these roles look like? Um, and what does it look like locally here uh, in the Piedmont Triad? So just to start, what do we know about public libraries and librarians uh, in the context of aging America and gerontology? Um, 
I mean, we basically know that across America, public librarians are finding innovative and locally unique ways uh, to collaborate with local, regional, and national partners to support older adults uh, and promote social in inclusion and learning across generations. Um, um, and just to, just to give some evidence of this scope, these are three books uh, recently published by American Library Association Editions. One is entitled Serving Grand Families and Libraries, uh, a Handbook and Programming Guide, Public Library Programs and Services for Midlife and Beyond, Expanding Opportunities for a Growing Population, uh, and Library Dementia Services, How to Meet the Needs of the Alzheimer's Community. So we have three books and three ways uh, that, that, uh, that public libraries serve older adults. Um, they serve older adults as caregivers um, for, for children. Um, they serve older adults as independent, uh, midlife and beyond. Um, and they serve older adults as individuals needing care um, in the form of library dementia services. Um, and I would argue that th these three books uh, taken collectively really, really speak to the holistic way in which public libraries are thinking about older adults um, and how they interface with them. And, and so, uh, but I, I also just want to point out that it is uh, um, one of the challenges is how idiosyncratically local it is, but I, I want to give one uh, big shout out to Lifetime Arts. Um, I don't know if people have heard of them, but they've really over the last decade have dramatically amplified their work with public libraries. Um, They've expanded from their uh, connecting through creative aging partnership uh, with libraries in New York City, uh, funded by the New York Community Trust, um, into what's now a nationwide program, um, uh, taking uh, creative aging programs and services uh, through state libraries um, to public libraries across the country. Um, so creative aging in Wyoming public libraries, um, is one manifestation of their um, innovative collaboration to, pr to promote wellness, combat social isolation through anti-ageism training and community-based arts, arts education programming, all centered around uh, the capacity of the public library to reach older adults in ways no other institution can. Um, just, to, just to give another example that I've been looking at, um, this is uh, Encore Cafe. This is the congregate meal service um, at a public library in Marion, Iowa. Um, and, and I think this, this story uh, is really telling in terms of how, how public library, how these things get going. Um, so uh, this is one of the case studies I've been looking at in my research. So um, in Marion, Iowa, um, the Heritage Area Agency on Aging was looking to create a senior center in the town of Marion, which like a lot of small towns across America doesn't have a senior center. So they, they didn't feel like they had a local place to go do programming. So the public library was getting ready to build a new library. Um, so the Heritage Area Agency on Aging rolled up to their, their kind of community input session and said, would it be possible for you all to create a, a designated senior center space in your new library? And the library is like, you don't have to wait for us to, new, <laughs> to build a new building to do that. We have a meeting room that we want community groups to use. And, and almost every single public library in America has a meeting room. Um, and so like, what? We had no idea. Like the, the public library has a meeting space. What? I thought this was just a place to go check out books. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but that idea of the public library as a meeting space was the seed that led to the Heritage Area Agency on Aging work with the Marion Library to have free congregate meals um, every month Monday and Friday with uh, food provided by Hy-Vee um, and it even won uh, an award. Um, and the libraries uh, who have been involved in this have really shared their motto uh, with, so this is the webinar that the librarians did with uh, the National Library of Medicine. Um, and the librarians said that libraries are often the de facto senior centers of our growing and aging communities. Um, the Marion Public Library embraces this role through program design, community feedback, and strategic partnerships. Um, in addition to traditional library programming, the library works to meet the nutritional and social needs of seniors through twice weekly congregate meals, as well as a monthly mobile food pantry visit. Um, and so it really just, um, uh, what I find remarkable about this story is that um, it really, uh, all that it took to really get going was a, a library that saw itself uh, as, as open to working with new partners um, and a partner that saw the library as more than just a place to go get books. Um, and through that, that kind of open thinking between both the library uh, and the partner, this new model for senior services uh, emerged. Um, 
And then I, I think it's also really important to, to also discuss how, how librarians are also trying to um, am, 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 amplify the message that they're more than their physical buildings, um, because um, uh, another big part of modern librarianship is outreach. Um, and we're seeing kind of a resurgence, not a return of the bookmobile. The bookmobile has kind of way, went away uh, by and large in the late 1970s during the gas crisis, uh, when it became extraordinarily expensive to run bookmobiles and more and more Americans were getting their information from different channels anyhow. So bookmobiles by and large disappeared. Um, but the, the idea of mobile library vehicles is coming back um, strong. So Alamance County has a, a library van, for instance. Um, Rockingham County has a library vehicle, especially in rural America, we're seeing a resurgence of these, these library vehicles. Um, and this in Billings, Montana, they, they have, as you can see right here, <laughs> Uh, a dedicated vehicle focused on senior outreach, um, which is kind of a unique instance I, uh, in America. But I, uh, what I what I want to point out is just the experimentation that's that's happening in libraries across America. Not every library has a senior outreach vehicle, but this one does, and others could. <laughs> and that's kind of the point. Uh, we're really in kind of a, a lot of thousand flowers bloom uh, moment in public librarianship in terms of anything can happen, and let's figure out uh, <laughs> how we can work together to 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 make our Communities, the best places they can be, um, and and that kind of uh, got got cranked up to eleven during COVID nineteen when the world turned upside down. Um, and this is a great example from Southeast Ohio, where uh, the Chillicothe and Ross County Public Library uh, partnered with Ross County two one one, as well as area service organizations to create this checking in uh, in this together service. Um, uh, the, the organizations work together to make friendly phone calls to check in on qualifying uh, individuals who may be isolated and lonely, and also to coordinate the essential delivery of supplies like food and toiletries um, with a, a, a big focus on the elderly, but not exclusively older adults, anyone who is homebound or had limited mobility during the pandemic. Um, and again, this is the type of thing um, that uh, I mean, there's no reason why why something like this uh, couldn't exist in other communities, and it probably does. Uh, but <laughs> it, it really has to do with uh, that that twofold uh, focus of a li librarian thinking outside of the box and, and partners thinking outside of the box as well. And when you have those two things come together, that's when something like this occurs. Um, um, and then there's just uh, I, there's just so many examples of partnerships, um, uh, and I'll just kind of. I'm not going to read through all of them, but uh, taking hotspots to, to people who, who didn't have access to the internet, um, uh, memory cafes offered virtually, um, uh, participation in vaccination efforts, um, uh, and then Bryan College Station Library uh, in Texas, where Texas A&M is, so obviously a university town, somewhat not, not unlike Greensboro. Um, uh, the, the library worked with the local senior living communities to launch a monthly pen pal program in which uh, youth could correspond with older adults. Um, and so, um, yeah, I think it's just, uh, it's, it's been amazing to see um, what libraries have done with partners during the pandemic, which is a theme I'll come back to um, in a few minutes. Um, but I, I, I really am hardened by, by how, how this, this, uh, this word is really getting out. Um, and the National Resource Center for Engaging Older Adults, uh, they've been really uh, doing a lot to promulgate this message. Um, and so this was kind of, they just posted this on Twitter. Um, it's partnering with your local library on your to-do list. Uh, it should be exclamation point. Libraries educate and provide recreation for older audiences. Learn how libraries can be used as a hub for social connection and engagement um, in our new blog post. Um, so I, I really think uh, for my money, this is the most critical message that's not getting broadly out to gerontologists across the country. <laughs> and so let's, let's, let's turn things around and let's figure out how we, how we get it out. Um, 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 and like I said, uh, the possibilities are endless. Uh, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, uh, they posted this amazing video, Fun and Fitness in the Library Parking Lot. Um, you can just find it on YouTube um, or on their Achieving Health Equity page. Um, it's an amazing five minute video about how a local group of older Asian Americans were looking for a space protected from the elements uh, for their, their community fitness group. And, and they came across the library had, having an enclosed parking lot. Um, <laughs> and so the Norma Avizu, the, the city librarian, 
uh, speaks about how, how, yeah, they want the library to be used by community members for this purpose. They'd love it to, if, if, if they, if, yes, please have your community fitness group use our parking lot. Um, <laughs> please use it for congregate meals. Please use it for, for fitness. Please use it for, for what you think older adults need. Uh, this is what this space is here for. Um, and then uh, just one final example I'll share. I've been really looking closely at AARP um, and their Livable Communities uh, Community Challenge Program, um, which if you don't know, is kind of a, a huge initiative to, to make uh, livable communities for all ages. Um, and they do these kind of community challenge grants. Um, and what's been remarkable to me is how many public libraries have gotten these grants, either by themselves or in collaboration with their communities. Um, and, and these are, I'm just gonna go through these quickly, but they're all across the country. Um, so in, in Arkansas, um, they have an expanded story trail and garden, adding planters, decorative seating and supplies um, to support library programs. Um, in Maine, um, uh, they provided outdoor seating at the library, Massachusetts, um, uh, free 24 hour outdoor Wi-Fi. Um, uh, so a lot of them are really focusing on augmenting the library's outdoor space, which I think a lot of people don't, don't realize. They, they think of the library as an indoor space. But if you go to the Greensboro Public Library, one of the first things that you're going to see is they have um, outside of the library a covered bench, uh, which has strong Wi-Fi and, um, and places to plug in devices. So the library is both uh, an indoor and an outdoor space um, and should be considered as part of the outdoor built environment. Um, but yeah, just uh, goes on and on. Uh, in North Dakota, Grand Forks Public Library got an AARP grant uh, to create an intergenerational music playground uh, that will bring people of all ages, cultures, and abilities together in an interactive and fun way that fosters community connections, inspires innovation, and encourages curiosity. You can just keep going and going. Um, <laughs> I'm just going to skim through that. Uh, I can I can share uh, a link to all of these uh, if people want to dive deeper. Um, but the, the key thing is, uh, yeah, let's, what's, what's standing in the way? So why, why are these things not happening everywhere? And, and what's really stopping us from, from leveraging all of that is possible by working with public librarians? Um, and, and I think it really does come, come down to perceptions. Uh, what I found in my research talking with partners um, is that if they're not already working with public librarians, they don't see them as partners. So that's, that's really what it comes down to. It's almost like <laughs> if you're not already deep into it with public librarians, um, you, you, don't, you don't see what's actually happening. Um, and uh, yeah, and I've really, I've really honed that understanding through uh, a series of 18 case studies, including with Mary in Iowa, um, which I mentioned um, as part of this early career grant. Uh, I've been interviewing about 60 entities that have collaborated with public libraries, including senior centers, including area agencies on aging, about what they, their, their experience has been working with public librarians. Um, and what I've really found um, across these 60 interviews um, is that partners by and large go through a process of evolution. Um, before they're working with libraries, they, they by and large uh, see libraries um, is, is a book repository, a space that has books, a space that gets books out, um, <laughs> either physically or digitally. Um, uh, they may, uh, as they begin to learn a little bit more about libraries, they may begin to see them as uh, a trusted resource, uh, this, this entity that exists across America, um, that people turn to, that are stable, that are trusted, and therefore um, a library, the space to use, to distribute food, uh, to hold classes, to have community meetings, um, to even have things like telehealth or social workers. Um, but what I found, uh, especially in, in the, the, the deep partners, the ones who've worked uh, collaboratively with libraries in some, in some cases for decades, um, is that uh, over time it shifts from the library as this passive space uh, that can be leveraged into li the librarians as critical partners um, who are part of kind of the community design process. So before you decide what you're gonna do, you first need to have librarians on your team because they're the ones who can help you figure out what's gonna be the most effective way to serve your community. Um, and that, that stage three um, is rare. It takes time to cultivate. Um, but I, I think uh, when, if we can get to that stage of, um, um, we can really have things that, that snowball and evolve. Um, and I'll just share, this is kind of probably one of my favorite examples from my research. Um, <laughs> Uh, so in Wilkes County and West Jefferson out there in, in uh, Western North Carolina, um, 
the library was participating in this big initiative from the Library of Congress, where they wanted to capture oral histories of, of people, veterans of World War II. Um, and so they started working really closely with the American Legion and some veterans groups. Um, and so then they had that relationship and they're like, okay, well, what else can we do to serve this community? And the American Legion said, well, we're, we're, we'd love to have a blood drive. Like we don't really, I mean, West Jefferson, if you've been out there, it's incredibly rural. Um, and so like, uh, would you be interested in working with us to ha have a blood drive? And they're like, sure, let's have a blood drive. And so they, they did. And, <laughs> but it's just like, uh, it's, it, that's kind of how things go. Once you're, once you're kind of in the door, so to speak, um, it's gonna go in directions you cannot anticipate. The library did not anticipate that they were gonna come out of that partnership holding a blood drive, uh, but that's, that's where things go. And that's how things go. You can't predict it. It has um, uh, the, uh, uh, an element of, of idiosyncratic unpredictability. But I think that's really where the magic is. The magic of public librarianship um, is that it is a, a canvas in which communities uh, can work collaboratively with public librarians to decide what they're going to do. It has, it has that, that flexibility in a way that no other public institution truly has. Um, and this is just a, a one interview I did as part of that research with uh, the Gale Board and Public Library District in Elgin, Illinois. Um, the branch manager told me, uh, I think we're, we're doing a great job of becoming the community center. I definitely think that the seniors that are active and aging in place uh, definitely see it as a community center. Some of them might not see themselves as seniors, so they don't want to go to the senior center, but they will be involved in the library and a lot of the library's programs. Um, and there always have been behind the scenes uh, community groups that have uh, partnered with the library because it's just a kind of a neutral ground. It's a place uh, everybody feels welcome. And, and what I really think that we have to do, I mean, the task before us, or I, I should say the task that, that I've <laughs> kind of chosen to take on is to take this behind the scenes partnering that we know is happening all across America and, and take it from behind the scenes to the, to the front of our policy agenda. Cause I think that's, that's really what's necessary to make this invisible work um, uh, visible and, and kind of uh, take into the next level. Um, but we do also know that, um, oh, I think, uh, about that. We also know uh, that um, there's a lot of work to do in terms of, uh, especially, uh, not, I know gerontology is not exclusively um, a health science, uh, but we also know uh, that uh, public librarians typically have much stronger relationships with entities uh, in the education and nonprofit sector than organizations. Um, and uh, the health sector. So this is just, um, I did a, a project with the South Carolina Center for Rural and Primary Healthcare last year, looking at needs and opportunities uh, relating to public library partnerships um, for health. Um, and, and, and just basically we found uh, that um, across all the, the types of entities asked about, public librarians typically reported having much more closely, close working relationships with schools um, and nonprofits and businesses. Um, any entity that was kind of in the health space was much less likely to, for librarians to report having very close or somewhat close working relationships. Um, so I think, uh, I think again, especially when we think about health and health promotion, that's an area where there's, there's a lot of room for growth of, of partnerships um, and collaborations. Um, the, the third study that I wanted to share just a little bit about, um, just keep an eye on the time here. Um, so during, during COVID-19, uh, some colleagues and, my, and I did a, a national kind of um, survey of how small and rural public libraries were continuing to support social connectedness among older adults. Um, and so um, we, we kind of did this um, strategic, um, I can't remember the exact, my, my colleague Fatih Oguz, he's the statistician, but basically we did cluster sampling, I think that's right. So we we, um, these, these states that you see before you, these are states where we could find um, directories of, of, with contact information for all public libraries in these states. Um, so then within that, uh, we constructed a random sample of all public libraries um, and then sent out that, that survey. Um, and uh, these are, yeah, so that's why some, some states uh, are included and some are not. It just was based on the availability of data and then a random sample within, within that availability of data. Um, um, but, uh, but yeah, so and our, our sample is somewhat reflective of the overall data set. So these are kind of the distribution of public libraries um, uh, of which there is almost 10,000 uh, enti uh, administrative entities, um, 17,000 library branches. Um, 
but uh, our sample had, um, yeah, this is kind of our, how that, that was uh, the, the distribution. Um, and then um, uh, within, within, within the sample, we had uh, a response rate of 350. So about uh, one third of those that we sampled um, uh, filled out the survey. Um, uh, and, um, and yeah, so, so overall though, um, we asked if, if, public, if, these, if they had offered any programs or services for older adults during the COVID-19 pandemic um, as of March, 2021. Um, and in general, about three, three quarters or 75% said they had offered some sort of programming or services uh, for, for older adults during the pandemic um, with those services uh, slightly more common in the Northeast uh, compared to other, other parts of the country. Um, but then when, when we drill down, and this is a little bit hard to see for those of you in the room, um, but when we, when we drill down into what were the most common programs or services offered, um, interestingly, uh, the most common, uh, commonly reported by 59% of the respondents was uh, the cross promotion of programs or services offered by other organizations. So in other words, the, the most common way that in which older adults continued to serve older adults during the pandemic was not by offering new services. It was instead by amplifying what others were trying to do, <laughs> which uh, goes back to what, what I've been saying all along is that, that the public libraries, uh, they do offer services by themselves, but um, I think uh, uh, increasingly they're, they're trying to collaborate and find novel ways of working with others to amplify what others are trying to do. Um, but they still did, yeah, homebound delivery service was the, the second most common, almost right behind 58%. Uh, so getting, getting library materials to people um, at home, um, virtual programming, um, um, yeah, uh, and then also this was this was kind of interesting, and and I think this is kind of really uh, speaks to the unique role of rural public libraries in particular. Fully fifty percent of the sample said that they offered some sort of check-in or conversation services, e.g., e library workers call library regulars to check in with them. Um, and I think uh, that that's, that that really speaks to the the deep deep social connections that that rural public libraries in particular have with older adults um, in their communities. Um, and this is just a. Uh, an example from that, uh, in an open-ended comment, uh, this librarian said, uh, as a small town in Northern Maine, I have made it our mission to reach out to our senior members of our community. A 91-year-old patron came in when we reopened June 1st and cried when she saw us. Hugs and masks were necessary, but I am so happy she wanted to see us. We care for our elders in many ways. Um, and I think that aspect in particular of rural librarianship is a subset of public librarianship is, is really, really poorly understood. Um, I think much of the discourse as it exists is, is mostly focused on urban America. And so, so rural librarianship is really kind of a black hole in terms of our, <laughs> our, our national understanding. Um, but yeah, this is just another example. Um, uh, another person wrote, we worked with the health department to come up with ideas for keeping seniors connected. One example was the idea of a drive-in movie using our blow-up movie screen. So first of all, like who knew public libraries had blow-up movie screens, but, uh, but it's like, yeah, it's like, it's the, it's the type of like hidden resource you wouldn't know unless you're, you're already connected with them. Um, the county health department did an excellent job keeping seniors connected with drive up bingo and a free fish fry that included a free flu vaccination. The libraries helped promote those events um, and provided space on a website for that and other initiatives like COVID vaccine. So, so really trying to both amplify what the health department was trying to do while also thinking of innovative ways that they could use their resources to keep, uh, keep older adults connected. Uh, just one last partner um, quote, the library entered into a partnership with our county senior center. Library staff members created materials to advertise uh, outreach home delivery to seniors receiving pickup on site or home delivered meals. Uh, the librarian spoke with each person who participates in the meal program and described library services available to them. They also rode with the meals delivery volunteer to, to distribute information and registered patrons for library cards um, and delivered materials to the senior center for pickup. So a really, a really close partnership. And, and, and again, I think what I find really interesting about some of these uh, things that happened during COVID-19 is they really explode the idea that the library is merely a, a physical space. Um, it's really about kind of uh, this, this uh, 
diffuse uh, ways in which, which librarians reach deep into the community, um, including at their physical space, but also through some of these innovative uh, forms of outreach that are, are becoming more common even before the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, but, uh, but I, I just wanted to, again, I think there's, there's a huge opportunity for more partnerships. So again, 59% said that uh, they had um, shared what other entities were doing to keep older adults connected, but only about 50% uh, uh, reported a strong or somewhat strong relationship between the library and local agencies that specialize in aging. Um, most, pub most rural librarians said uh, they felt like there was a strong relationship between library staff and older adults. Um, and between the library and older adults in the community. So that, that's, where, that's where things are strong, where things are weak is that interinstitutional collaboration. And that's really where, where the, there's the greatest need for um, increased research, increased advocacy, increased um, policy focused on, hey, anyone trying to make a difference in the lives of older adults, you should be working with public librarians. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's really the, as simple, in a simple way as I can put it. Um, um, and then just the final one I want to share, um, and uh, I have a video here that was uh, made uh, by, uh, in collaboration with uh, some gerontology students uh, last summer. Um, I don't think I'll, I'll share it now, but um, yeah, uh, I can uh, but definitely uh, encourage taking a look at it. They did a great job. Um, but this was just a, a study before the pandemic. Um, in which uh, I worked with a, a fitness company based in California. They were trying to do more kind of, um, uh, yeah, video-based uh, fitness classes uh, that were available either on DVD or you could stream them um, in public spaces. Um, and so we worked with them to, to um, uh, try, try out the, in, in about 50 public libraries, agreed to kind of be guinea pigs as it were, <laughs> um, and to offer these, uh, these fitness classes for older adults over a 12-week period. Um, in total, we had about uh, 530 older adults complete all 12 weeks of the program. Um, this is a photo of, uh, of some of them in a, a tiny, tiny uh, town of Du Bois, Du Bois, uh, Indiana, population 488. Um, um, and, and yeah, so I, it was just a really uh, an amazing study. Um, and and what, I, what I found so fascinating was, was how easy it was to put together. Like I, I often hear people talking about, oh, it's so difficult to get, uh, get entities to collaborate and, and cite for my research. I mean, and it's like, this was remarkably easy for, for someone who ha has a modicum of knowledge about how public librarians work. Um, you can do this on a big scale, fast, quick, um, and with incredible impacts. Um, um, and and I, I really want to also highlight Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. They've really done, uh, I, I shared kind of earlier that fun and fitness in the library parking lot um, is they've really uh, built out uh, understanding of the social determinants of health um, and how to build cultures of health. Um, they've really amplified uh, the, the critical importance of public libraries to cultures of health. Um, so in their creating a healthier, more equitable communities policy agenda, uh, they, they talk about how things like walkability, um, the presence of act and, and well-funded public libraries um, and youth safety are, are three kind of cornerstones of things that, that lead to um, healthier, more equitable communities. Um, and so I really love how, how they're explicitly saying that public libraries are, are critical components of cultures of health and communities. Um, and I think that's also a message that we need, to be, we need to be saying more out loud in terms of our policy, in terms of our, when we think about health promotion and how it occurs. Um, um, and so I think there's, a, there's a, I wanna, wanna commend them for this work and, and it would encourage more people working on the policy front uh, to be uh, promulgating this message. And then I uh, just want to end, so I, I mentioned earlier about uh, this uh, National Federation of Aging uh, webinar. I mentioned that at the beginning, uh, <laughs> I, I pulled this directly from, uh, from that webinar. Uh, they featured the Akron Canton Area Agency on Aging. Um, one of their staff members from the AAA there um, uh, talked about how they got started working with public libraries. Um, and, and in their presentation, they talked about how initial discussion with leaders of the largest library system in our area, name, namely the Akron Summit County Public Library, led to brainstorming of ways to work together for mutual advantage. Um, then COVID-19 happened and they had to figure out uh, how to continue collaborating. 
And that's that's really the where my my kind of end. Like, I mean, what's what's stopping you from brainstorming ways to work together for mutual advantage uh, with your local library? Um, um, I uh, what yeah, what's what's stopping that? How can we encourage more more kind of brainstorming in that way? Um, and let's brainstorm together about ways uh, we could do this better. Um, and, and just want to end by talking about where it could lead. Um, so when I came to Greensboro in 2016, um, I met uh, Laura Bolton Plunkett, who used to be the community outreach coordinator for the, the Piedmont Triad Area Agency on Aging. She now works uh, for the National Council on Aging. She got, a, got, a, got moved up in the world um, a few years ago. Um, but uh, I met, I met Laura at uh, one of the growth networking events um, in the spring of 2017, so during my first year here, um, and we got talking about uh, the programs, their age well programs that they, they try to offer throughout their service region, um, and it's always a struggle trying to get these classes uh, in rural parts of the state or rural parts of their service area. Um, and they had some, Laura said she had some success, uh, a librarian in Walkertown had spontaneously reached out to her. And so they had done false prevention, a matter of balance classes, um, but she didn't really have any relationships with any of the other public librarians um, uh, across the, the Piedmont Triad AAA service area. So I'm like, well, would you like those <laughs> relationships? Um, and, and I sent a bunch of emails uh, kind of CCing her and, and kind of public library uh, directors from across the region. Um, and in Northwest uh, North Carolina and Elkin, uh, Mount Airy, um, it really took off. Um, the, the librarians there were, they loved it. Like they're, I mean, they, they were hungry for those types of connections. They, they like, oh my God, you have these programs that we can offer and like, um, like it was like a flam dunk for them. Um, and and, uh, and it became so popular that, that before the pandemic, um, uh, the Piedmont Triad Regional Council Area Agency on Aging actually, actually worked um, to offer uh, a, matter, a matter of balance training uh, to the public librarians that you see on the screen in front of you so that they could actually offer the programs themselves rather than um, relying entirely on, on volunteers that the, the AAA made available to, to make the program even more sustainable. Um, and so um, I, I want to point that out because when I talk about this topic, especially at UNCG, people always want to talk about the Greensboro Public Library. And I think the Greensboro Public Library is great. Uh, they're also inundated by, by requests from people that want to work with them. Um, and so if you really want to get started, I would really encourage anyone to consider uh, some of the more rural regions around Greensboro. Those libraries are hungry for partnerships. Um, <laughs> and, and you're going to find much more fertile soil um, if you're trying to get some initial traction. And if you can get things going out in Mount Airy or Elkin, you can bring it back to Greensboro. But um, it's better to start kind of somewhere outside of uh, a place like Greensboro where where it's just, uh, yeah, for, for a lot of reasons we can discuss. And, and I think that's true of urban America in general. Like I think rural, rural libraries, um, uh, what they lack in resources, they often make up for in extreme flexibility. <laughs> so just uh, the ability to, to try new things without a lot of bureaucracy or red tape or kind of a, a city risk manager breathing down their neck. Um, they can just, uh, yeah, offer video-based fitness classes without having to go through layers of clearance. Um, and so, um, I, I think it is, uh, it's telling and interesting that this, this idea really took off the most uh, in, in a place like Elkton rather than in Greensboro. Um, and I think that also should tell us where, where our attention um, should focus if we're trying to have the biggest impact um, uh, at, least, uh, at least initially. Although I, I will say, um, <laughs> like, like most things with libraries, it, it also depends. So Lifetime Arts that I mentioned, they started in New York City. So they, they first had the, their uh, success with these creative aging classes initially um, across the boroughs of New York City, and then, then it scaled to a nationwide program. So that's, that's an example of the exact opposite of, <laughs> of what I'm saying in the sense that it started in urban America and then moved out to a place like Wyoming. Um, so I, I mean, I think in, in closing, I think it is, um, it's unpredictable. I think that there's, there, there really is no, no best way to build relationships with public librarians. Um, as long as you're, you're, you see it as a priority, um, you're, you're kind of coming in with the recognition that public librarians do a lot and, and are seeking uh, opportunities to do more through partnerships um, and see, see where it takes you. Um, uh, I'll be something in the chat here. 
Oh yeah, when Noah finished, feel free to raise your hand. Um, yeah, so just just closing thoughts. So just to, just to bring it back to where we began. So 1976, um, and I just chose this because it's probably the most uh, vivid evocation of this idea. But you can find this throughout public library history. Um, uh, what should the library do? Um, this national report from Australia says uh, there is nothing that a community cannot do in its library if it sees the need and allocates the necessary priority provided the state and commonwealth give it the necessary support. Um, and that's as true now as it was then. So let's let's go ahead and, and figure out um, how we want to work with librarians to, to keep older adults connected and, and to serve our communities. Um, so, um, oh yeah, and just one more. Um, I'll just, uh, this is, I, I, I swear this is my last one. Um, this Janet Reynolds, uh, she's just, uh, so Janet Reynolds, I love Janet Reynolds. Um, she's one of my, I mean, I, I think she's like, she is just, uh, I mean, she's an example of one of these public library rock stars. Um, she literally, she graduated from high school and, and turned around and started working at her local library. Um, she eventually went back and got a college degree um, and a master's degree, but the whole time working at her local library um, in Lathene, Kansas. So she's, she's now worked at her local library for almost 45 years. Um, um, and uh, she's, uh, she did this uh, presentation for the Nebraska Library Commission a couple of years ago called Fitness, Food, and Fun uh, with Senior Citizens, that is, um, and uh, serving our senior patrons with programs to enrich the mind, body, and need for social interaction. And it's just an amazing kind of voice from the field. So if you, if you really want to hear what I'm saying from the perspective of a public librarian, um, this presentation by Janet Reynolds is the place to go because... Uh, in, in a much less academic way, she's basically saying everything that I've said uh, today. Um, so we'll definitely encourage that uh, if you want to want to hear it um, from the horse's mouth, uh, as it were. Um, so yeah, so just an open discussion. Um, how do we close this gap? Uh, I, I think there's a gap between gerontology and public librarianship. Uh, you may not agree, but uh, I, that's, I, 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 I observe there to be one, um, <laughs> and I would like to close it. Um, and so I, I think some easy ways to get started are to, to get involved, uh, join the library's friends group, uh, join the library's board of trustees, uh, suggest a partnership, uh, become an engaged volunteer, um, or just simply suggest, hey, let's, let's get together and talk about what we could do together. Um, uh, I think where things go off the rails is people come in with a very predetermined agenda of what they want to occur. Um, and that, that is a terrible way to build an authentic, meaningful, uh, mutual partnership. Um, so um, if, if you're tr trying to just get the library to do something for you, it's probably not going to work. And that's, that's just true. I mean, I think that's people, you all know this. I mean, this is not rocket science, but I think sometimes people imagine, oh, the public library is just kind of this, this path of receptacle for whatever I'm trying to get going. Um, so the same skills that we, we use as we approach partnerships with other entities, that, that same kind of um, time um, and, and open-mindedness needs to, needs to be applied to public librarianship. Um, but, uh, but yeah, let's, uh, let's uh, and I see um, Krista has her camera on. Let's see, I think I'm gonna, um, I wonder if I can stop sharing here. Yeah, so um, yeah, Krista, go ahead. If I can get this. Oh, um, and let's see. Speaker on, I don't know. Yep, I can hear you now. Okay, perfect. Hi, yes, thank you so much for this. There was a, a lot packed in there and I so appreciate it. Um, kind of a comment and then also a question. Um, I really like the idea of moving um, some aging services programming into the local libraries in rural areas. Oftentimes it seems like faith communities end up stepping in. Can you hear me? You're, you're frozen on my end. I'm hoping you can oh, I, I can hear you. Yeah, okay. Hear you. <laughs> um, and, and I've seen that as I've um, looked at kind of what's offered across North Carolina that sometimes um, churches will end up being the places where congregate meals happen, etc. And I think that libraries can play a nice role in um, creating a welcoming space to folks who might not be comfortable in a faith space, mm -hmm. um, folks that have, you know, different identities that might feel marginalized and uncomfortable um, in a faith-based yeah. space. And having sort yeah. of work on, like, the secular end of aging at the Council yeah. on Aging in Chatham and also, you know, doing some aging stuff for the Council of Churches in North Carolina, I can yeah. see sort of like the the faith-based partnerships are amazing, but also this opportunity to use the library that's a welcoming space for everyone, um, mm -hmm. I think should definitely be utilized. 
Yeah. And to that, yeah. Um, to that kind of like tangential to that, um, I like the idea of the library just in general being kind of this place that sort of transcends socioeconomic stratification. Like you see people from all walks of life at the library. And I think that's a really great opportunity for shifting the way um, older adults relate to one another um, across socioeconomic bounds. Because I even saw that at the Council on Aging where it seemed like unintentionally, I kind of did some work around like racial segregation, but there's also socioeconomic uh, sort of uh, segregation in terms of who was using what programs. So just, I mean, just thoughts or whatever about how the library might be used in that in that sense to kind of transcend those bounds or I don't know these are just thoughts comments whatever but yeah again thank you. <laughs> no and thank you so much Krista I, and I really love kind of that that kind of comparison that you're making between public libraries and faith-based communities um because it's one that I've thought a lot about um and so so for instance the American Public Health Association they actually have a caucus on on public health and faith-based communities um and I've often thought like why don't we have that for public libraries like why do we not have a caucus on public health and, and public libraries um and and I think to be honest uh I mean and, and no offense to my colleagues at the Jackson Library um it's not your fault <laughs> but I, I think oftentimes what happens especially in institutions of higher education is people imagine that academic libraries are synonymous with public libraries and the two could not be more dissimilar um, they have some core functions that they have together but in terms of day-to-day -day operations these are apples and oranges um, and so i think because of that um, uh, within within public health there's, there's often a, a focus on medical librarianship or health sciences librarianship um, and and kind of the, the public librarianship is really misunderstood and, and under under underappreciated as a unique partner which has its own infrastructure so i'll say that first um, um, but then um yeah i i I'll, I'll also say that the public libraries are increasingly seeking to work with, with faith-based institutions. Uh, so there's also that opportunity for partnerships. So um, uh, a few weeks ago, I was at the Association for Rural and Small Libraries Conference in Chattanooga. Um, and one of the, the presenters were from Madison County, North Carolina. Um, and they, they were talking, the, the librarians out in Madison County were talking about how they've worked with kind of a, an interface alliance um, to address some of the food insecurity issues that they were seeing. Um, so you may have heard of something called a blessings box or a little food pantry um, uh, so that the Interface Alliance worked with the public libraries of Madison County to get these little food pantries um, at public library locations so people can leave food, take food, and no questions asked. Um, so I think there's even, even within uh, work with faith-based communities, there's opportunities to, to build, build partnerships. So yeah, but I, I, would, I would definitely agree I mean, I think um, if we just took some of the, the policy uh, focus uh, from on faith-based communities and apply that same energy to public libraries, we'd be almost 90% uh, <laughs> of the way there, because I think there, there's so much that they have in common. Um, I mean, like, like faith-based communities, uh, a public library's primary focus is not focused on feeding people or having fitness classes, um, but they have that, that ancillary community purpose, which is so strong. Um, so just like faith-based communities uh, play a role in parishioners' lives beyond their spiritual lives, um, so too do public libraries play a role in people's uh, lives beyond kind of books and information. So that I think that the parallels are really, really deep and profound once you once you start thinking about them. Thanks. Yeah, and I wonder too if you know, given the amount of pressure public libraries are on currently mm -hmm. yeah. under, I should say, if having yeah. this more you know multi generational focus for the library could get more people engaged with um, pushing back against the pressures on on public libraries that yeah. are currently. Happening. Yeah, and, and I think that, that, uh, that's, that's, so Krista, just to make sure people hear it in the room, I, I should be repeating these just to make, so Krista's talking about the pressures that public libraries are on, um, and they certainly are uh, under a lot of pressure right now with, with book banning, um, and even beyond book banning, even, even kind of just, uh, uh, so I talked about Mary in Iowa, um, one of the people that I interviewed moved on to work at another library in Iowa, and she ended up leaving that library because uh, not only was she getting so much pressure to um, to restrict access to certain books she had in her collection, she was also getting pressure to 
to basically, I mean, police who worked at the library, like there was a, an LGBTQ staff member who was like really being harassed by some of the board. Um, and so I think, um, I, think uh, I, I think when we think about the pressures that libraries are, are under, we should think about it as, as really uh, they're, they're deep into the culture wars that we're, we're, we're seeing in America. And it goes way beyond books. Um, uh, books are, are kind of just the, the tip of the iceberg in terms of, of public libraries position and kind of the culture wars right now. Um, but yeah, um, but I, I think also I would say um, uh, oftentimes I sometimes hear public libraries are, are under a lot of pressure and therefore I'm not gonna reach out to them because uh, I, might be, I might be adding to their burden. Um, but I think that's only true if you're just looking to get public libraries to do something for you. <laughs> if, if, you're, if you're instead seeking to, to forge an authentic mutual partnership, you're not going to add the public library's burden by seeking to work with them. Yeah. This is a How we can close the gap between uh, gerontology and libraries. And I was thinking it from the, of the perspective that library, public libraries are often part of the larger city mm -hmm. municipalities, right? Mm -hmm. their, their leaders are often tied to leadership of, of the city. Mm -hmm. And so when we're talking about you know, the, the community programming or the things that cities or public libraries often offer, mm -hmm. I'm wondering if they're being directed by broader leadership of the city. Mm -hmm. So if libraries aren't spearheading aging mm -hmm. services or offering things to the older adult, is that a reflection of the city leadership not making aging mm -hmm. a priority within the community? Mm -hmm. So it's not really a question, it's just kind of a commentary on, on, on what issues that could be happening mm -hmm. and, and, and what we could do to possibly solve them. Yeah, um, so Elisa uh, uh, made a really great question about thinking about the fact that public libraries are, uh, for the most part, kind of uh, parts of city or county governments. Um, um, and therefore, they 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 kind of are are part of that that city and county kind of system. And so, uh, the the comparative absence or presence of kind of uh, services for seniors could in part be a reflection of kind of um, a presence or absence of kind of a, a political agenda focused on on aging within within local government. Uh, if I if I'm um, and yeah, I mean I yeah, I mean I think that that's. Uh, that's that's true um, uh, to to a certain extent, um, and and I think one one great example is in in New York City. Um, I'd have to go back and look at my files, but the the city had this big uh, kind of um, citywide kind of action agenda on on older adults, um, and they they really uh, in part due to the work that Eric Kleinenberg has done that I mentioned earlier. They really uh, kind of had public libraries as a cornerstone of kind of. Uh, uh, citywide services for for older adults. So that that's an example of um, uh, yeah, libraries really being uh, written into uh, uh, city plans. But um, I think uh, I think what often uh, public libraries um, are kind of um, yeah, they they are kind of uh, semi autonomous, uh, even though they're part of city government. And I think that's that's something um, that is, is unique and special. And and I, I think uh, just thinking about New York City. Um, um, Alexandria Ocasio Cortez, a uh, huge, huge library advocate, um, <laughs> and partly trolling kind of uh, those on the on the political right. Uh, she she made a comment a few years ago about how um, if public libraries didn't already exist, uh, there's no way that um, they could come to exist in modern America um, based on our, on our present political climate. Um, and 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 then she's gone on to basically say like if if people on the right actually knew what public libraries are up to, they'd probably cease. To exist, um, <laughs> and so I and so I think kind of um, I, I think sometimes uh, I, I speculate, and this is just a, a speculation. I think sometimes um, public librarians uh, don't kind of broadcast what they're up to as loudly as they could out of a, a survival mechanism. <laughs> um, they can they can kind of be be kind of operating behind the scenes in ways to 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 reach people. Um, without kind of, um, because it is, it's one of the things that's remarkable, and, and I'm, this is kind of dancing around your question, but um, one of the things that I find remarkable is that uh, 
in, in the, the most conservative parts of America, for the most part, I mean, this, this has started to change recently and uh, with, with some of the culture wars stuff that we're seeing, but um, historically, at least, uh, even, even in, in the reddest, most conservative parts of America, you can sometimes find um, quite well-funded public libraries um, with, uh, with strong budgets um, and strong local support. Um, and, and I think one of the reasons why is that uh, public libraries are, are seen as kind of uh, in, for better or worse, and kind of our, our decentralized um, American jurisprudence. Um, they're seen as kind of uh, a truly local institution, not controlled by, by the state capital or <laughs> by Washington, DC. Um, and so I think that that also opens up a space for, for more autonomy, more kind of, um, so I, I think um, most, most public libraries, even though they're part of city and county government, uh, they have uh, often extraordinarily um, latitude. And I'll just, share, I'll just share kind of quickly an example from here in Greensboro. So um, some of you may know this is not having to do with older adults, but um, in 2018, um, I started working with uh, um, uh, the Department of Social Work here to start having Masters of Social Work students uh, placed uh, in, in Greensboro and High Point Public Libraries. So maybe it was 2019. I think that I think the first students were placed in fall of 2019. That's right, because they, they had about one year before COVID <laughs> arrived. Um, but anyhow, I mean, yeah, so having social work students do their, their one year practicum at public libraries is an idea that's kind of taken off across America. Um, but, but one of the things that's interesting is so, so Bridget Blanton, the library director here in Greensboro, um, she, we were talking about how, how, the, how the partnership was going. Um, and she mentioned to me that like uh, the person that she reports to in the city of Greensboro didn't even find out about it um, until the a and uh, released a press release about it because it's the joint master of the social work program with a and <laughs> And I'm like, that really speaks to how autonomous the library is as an institution where they have this program, they have this partnership and the people that Bridget reports to had no idea about it until it showed up in the media. Um, and I think that's, that's, I mean, that's, that's, that's very telling of kind of the autonomous space of public librarianship and the ability of public librarians to do things um, without, uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't know, being a shield to city hall. <laughs> yeah, Rebecca? I'll come up there and ask it so you don't have to repeat it. Um, so my question is, uh, well, first of all, I want to make a comment. My graduate assistant who comes from that social work program mm -hmm. is doing her internship oh, great, at yeah. the library this semester. It's a nice segue. Um, but I have a question for you, Noah, about demographics, uh, because um, my mother, who mm -hmm. would be 90 now, um, was an avid reader and read every book in the Lexington Library. And so I had to start taking her to the Greensboro Library. But the last time I was in the library was with her. And I'm 70. And I... I used to have a relationship with the public library, but I no longer do. And I'm wondering if this is a fleeting opportunity. Uh, even, you know, it's possible libraries will be transformed and therefore it won't be fleeting. But I'm wondering about recruitment strategy when the members of what may be inappropriately called the silent generation um, are no longer. Uh, going to the library. Mm -hmm. I haven't even been in the UNCG library except to go to the computer lab for a very long time, so. Yeah, um, well, Rebecca, uh, uh, first thing, uh, you should go. Uh, so that's, <laughs> that's, that's number one. Uh, but, but the second thing is, I think kind of this idea that uh, public librarians are kind of disappearing because of obsolescence um, is, is complete fantasy. Um, uh, and, and I think if you go to... In what? I, I don't think okay. librarians are Oh, the libraries. Well, so here's um, what the, the, I mean, libraries are part of that. So uh, before COVID-19, I was looking at library construction. Um, and I don't think people realized between 2015 and 2020, there were more new public library buildings planned um, than perhaps any age in American history. Um, so go to Forsyth County. They have a new, new downtown library in Winston-Salem. They just opened a new one in Durham. They're getting ready to open a new one in Charlotte. Um, I mean, the Greensboro Public Library has not been around for that long. It 
move from where the Elon Law School is. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I think um, that idea comes from a place of privilege, to be honest. Um, I think the people who have the privilege do not need the library. Um, uh, it is a privilege to not need it. And I think for a lot of people, it's an absolute necessity. Um, and, and I think that's something that we really need to, to take, a, take into consideration. And we know that um, uh, library funding has, um, despite some ups and downs, um, it kind of ebbs and flows with the economy. It went down during the Great Recession, but then rebounded very fast um, uh, around 20, 15, um, it's always vulnerable. Public library funding is always, always vulnerable. Um, a, a big, big part of being a public librarian is being an advocate for, <laughs> for funding because it is kind of an institution that's always on the chopping block. Um, but uh, I think uh, nonetheless, um, I mean, I think there, there has been, um, especially at the local level, a lot of uh, new, new funding for, for library construction. Um, I'm, I'm going to the new Durham Library this Friday um, for, for an event. Um, and it'll be my first time there. It opened, well, it was, it was gonna open in May of 2020 and obviously got that opening, got pushed back. Um, but I've heard the new Durham Library is, is absolutely amazing. Um, and, 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 and I'll just say about library construction, this is kind of a segue, but I think it's relevant. Um, these new library buildings are really being designed uh, with an intentional focus on them being multi-generational multi community centers. So probably the most vivid illustration of that uh, is in Wilmington, North Carolina, um, the, one of the newest branches of the new Hanover County Library. It was built uh, with, with the idea that every single thing within the four walls of that building can be moved around if needed. So as opposed to having, I mean, the, the old library was like, you have the, the physical stacks and everything is built around those physical stacks. Um, and I mean, that's, yeah, I think Jackson Library, like, I mean, that, that was kind of the old idea. Like it's, it's the physical stacks and everything else is kind of built around that. Um, now it's the complete opposite. They're being intentionally built uh, to be these spaces that are multi-purpose, um, adaptable, because the, the rationale being that 20 years from now, what, what people are gonna want from public libraries is gonna be completely different from what it is today. Um, and that's intentionally being incorporated into the built environment. Um, Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, that um, sort of addresses my question. I think you're seeing it as transforming. Mm -hmm. I see a lot of irony in libraries not amplifying the work that they do, mm. but you know, <laughs> yeah. being uh, vulnerable to budget cuts. Yeah. yeah. You know, because they're not yes. talking about the work that they're doing in community spaces mm -hmm. that, that city municipalities think that all they're doing is just providing books when they're doing so much more because mm -hmm. they're not telling their story. Yeah. The yeah. No, and, and I. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, uh, and that's, that's kind of from, from a library side, I mean, as someone who also does um, 